Hi, this is Ben Lowell with Back to the Bible Canada and Dr. John Newfeld. Well, we're beginning our second week of our series, Defending the Faith. So let's turn to our Bibles to Psalm chapter 19, verses 1 to 11, as Dr. Newfeld brings us a message called Science and Faith, Part 1. I want to begin my discussion of science and faith by reading Psalm 19, 1 to 11. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims His handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out to all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them He has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the end of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. You know, liberal theologians have often stated that Psalm 19 doesn't make sense. They say it must be a compilation of two different psalms because, well, the first six verses are about the glory of God in creation, that is, the heavens declare the glory of God. And then in verses 7 to 11, they're a hymn of praise about the Mosaic law. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. So it's been suggested that in some fashion, most likely by an ancient scribe, that these two psalms were joined together, some say by mistake, and now appear as they do in our Bible. But of course, that's just the liberal view of things. And it always seems to me at least a predictable view for it. It just never loses an opportunity to attempt to discredit the Bible. But a closer examination reveals something different, something altogether fascinating. So today and tomorrow, as we examine the matter of faith and science, well, I've hoped to show that the matter of the physical universe, which displays the glory of God, and the matter of God's revelation of himself in Scripture, are really two things that belong into one psalm. So Psalm 19 is about God speaking, both in the world and then in his word. Both are a showcase of a God who is constantly revealing himself. He's constantly communicating. He's always making himself known. So let me set the stage for this. In the year 1613, the Italian astronomer Galileo wrote, Both the Holy Scriptures and nature proceed from the divine word, the former as the sayings of the Holy Spirit, and the latter as the most observant executrix of God's orders. The two never contradict each other. That's exactly what Psalm 19 is about. It's about a God who speaks, a God who's not silent, a God whose voice has gone out to all who will listen. He speaks in the creation which declares his glory, and he speaks in his law or he speaks in his revealed word which rejoice the heart and give light to the eyes. It was the great scientist Francis Bacon who said, God has in fact written two books, not just one. Of course, we are all familiar with the first book he wrote, namely, Scripture. But he's written a second book called Creation two books of God, Scripture and creation, so very different and yet so in harmony with each other. In Romans 1 verse 20, Paul speaks of the book of creation in this way. He says, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. Every single human being has heard the speech of God. We are without excuse. God has revealed himself in his book of creation, but his special revelation, the book of Scripture, well, it alone can revive the soul. It alone can bring you peace with God. It alone can give you the forgiveness of sins. The physical universe can reveal his power and divine nature, but not his redemption, not intimacy with the Creator. That comes from his special revelation. It comes from his book called the Bible. And I'm not telling you any secrets. If I tell you, that's not how a lot of people see it today. See, there's a common misperception that science and Scripture are in conflict, that you either believe one or you believe the other. 
See, how many times have you heard someone say, you know, I don't believe in God or I don't believe in religion, I believe in science. You know, the famous atheist scientist Richard Dawkins, in his book entitled The God Delusion, writes the following. He says, as a scientist, I am hostile to fundamentalist religion because it actively debauches the scientific enterprise. It teaches us not to change our minds and not to want to know exciting things that are available to be known. In other words, Dawkins believes that whenever believers find evidence in science that contradicts the Bible, well, they just run back to the Bible and simply disbelieve the evidence of science. And that, he thinks, shuts them off from the excitement of discovery. They can never admit that they were wrong, says Dawkins, and so they never learn new things. Of course, he has a case in history, a case that deals with the trial of Galileo in the year 1633. And if you don't know about the trial of Galileo, you do well to learn it. So here's the drama. Astronomers from the Vatican, and yes, the Vatican had and still has a scientific division. So in 1633, astronomers from the Vatican said that it was simply impossible to believe that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Galileo had said that the Earth was circling the sun, but the Vatican astronomers said that was a heresy, and they quoted the Bible. First Chronicles 16 verse 30 says, Tremble before him all the earth. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. And so from the perspective of the Vatican, the Earth was stationary, and all the other planets moved around the Earth. At least that's what the Vatican said that the Bible said. And they had 1 Chronicles 16.30 to back them up, but they also had Psalm 104, verse 5. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. And also Psalm 93, verse 1. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. And so the belief in a stationary planet, the earth, in which all planets circle the earth, had in some time in the past become church doctrine. And that's the idea that the earth is the center of the universe. Now, of course, all of those verses were horribly misinterpreted. The point of Chronicles was to teach us that God would never remove the earth from his eternal plans. When the writer of Chronicles said that the earth cannot be moved, he wasn't talking about the nature of the cosmos or the science of cosmology. You just check the context. This is a statement not about the universe, but about the fact that God will never remove the earth from his eternal plans. This text has nothing to do with science. You know, the same is true about the two psalms that I quoted. The psalmist is not concerned at all with physics, rather that God established the earth when he created it as the place where he would celebrate his glory. And that is fixed, unmoved, established for all times. And so there's nothing in the Bible that would indicate that the earth is flat or that the earth is the center of the universe or that the planets revolve around the earth. And yet, In times past, it was precisely these verses that were used to persecute and try to silence Galileo. And ever since the Galileo incident, many people think that science and the Bible just contradict each other. From their vantage point, the Bible was written in a pre-scientific era, and so it just reflects a view of cosmology that's wrong. And so, as some would say, let the Bible speak about religion but not about science. And in the heat of the debate with the church, Galileo quoted Cardinal Baronius, who in 1598 said, the Bible was written to show us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. And so has come the assumption that we should keep the Bible out of the realm of facts. And with that as a background, let's get back to the Galileo incident. And as we do, we need to ask ourselves if it's really true that the Bible is in conflict with science. Galileo Galilei lived from 1564 to 1642. Now, those dates are significant, and I'm going to get back to that in a moment. But for now, please remember that it was in 1517 that Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the door of the church in Wittenberg, sparking off the Protestant Reformation. Now, as I said, I'm going to get back to the significance of that. But for now, let's just remember that Galileo was born 47 years after the start of the Protestant Reformation and that he built his first telescope another 46 years later, that is, a full 93 years after the Reformation, and that his trial was held in 1633, which is 116 years after the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. Okay, let's get to the drama. 
when Galileo started looking through his telescope, one of the things he observed were the motions of Jupiter's moons. Now, here was evidence that not all of the heavenly bodies revolve around the Earth. But he also observed the phases of Venus, showing him clear and unmistakable evidence that Venus moves around the Sun and not the Earth. And in response, some of the Vatican astronomers simply refused to look into Galileo's telescope. They didn't need evidence. They had 1 Chronicles 16, verse 30, and that is what Richard Dawkins was talking about. This is what Christian leaders are saying about Donald Whitney's book, Family Worship. It's a practical guide for parents, especially fathers, to get from what we should to what we can and do. This book will equip you to lead your family in worship without fear. This book could change your home. What is modeled and experienced in the home shapes lives. So Back to the Bible Canada is making the book Family Worship available to our listeners for free the same month Dr. Newfeld is teaching his new series, Family of Influence. We want to do all we can to equip you and your family to be all God has designed you to be. So make sure to listen and ask for your free copy of Family Worship today. And if you're able, consider supporting this ministry with your prayers and a financial gift. The generosity of people right across Canada make this program possible. Call today at 1-800-663-2425 or visit backtothebible.ca. Now, after Galileo, a myth is being perpetuated. Science and the Bible contradict each other. So popular television programs and movies love to present two antagonist personalities, the person of science and the person of faith or of religion. See, I don't believe I've ever seen a movie in which both of them are pictured in the same person. And many people simply assume that the Bible has been proved false by science. You know, one of the great myths of our day is the actual history of Galileo. Now, you might remember from your own study of history that Galileo was in terrible health. He was hauled off to trial in Rome before an inquisition. There he was forced, under the threat of torture, to renounce his scientific writings, writings that showed that the earth was not the center of the universe. And the way many understand the story is that Galileo was opposed by the Bible. But here's what's often forgotten. Long before his famous trial in 1633, Galileo had already presented his theories to the theologians in Rome and even invited them to look through his famous telescope. Father Clavius, who led the community of, of Jesuit scholars in the Jesuit college in Rome, had no theological objection to what Galileo was proposing. Furthermore, Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, overseeing a church commission looking into Galileo's theories, also saw no theological objection. And then finally, Galileo met with Pope Paul V, who was reported to be favorably impressed by his findings. So what happened? How do we get from that to a church trial with the threat of torture? Well, Charles Hummel in his book, The Galileo Connection, says the following. He says, it is curious that despite the evidence, Historians of science have seldom blamed the university professors for their part in the decision against Copernicus and Galileo, their opposition to freedom of scientific inquiry, and yet it was they, the leading scientists, who urged the theologians to intervene, confident that the church would be on their side. In fact, so much more can be said. Galileo himself, until the day of his death, never blamed the church, but he did blame the university professors for what happened to him. He called those professors frauds who tricked the church by their schemes. But while this was certainly a part of it, the story, in my view, is a lot more complicated than that. How were the university professors able to intervene and, as Galileo thought, trick the church? I mean, what else was going on? Well, so much more. But before we look at what it was, let's understand the genuine nature of the conflict. This was not about the Bible at all. Indeed, in its day, the conflict was really between Copernican science and Aristotelian science. So what am I talking about? The ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle lived in the fourth century before Christ. Aristotle believed and taught that the universe was finite and that the earth was its center. 
And that way of thinking held sway in the Roman Catholic Church. But why? Why was the church interested in defending Aristotle and putting the reputation of the church on the line? Well, here's the answer. Long before Galileo, the Roman Catholic Church had become increasingly Aristotelian in its philosophy. That in itself is a fascinating thing. But it is absolutely true that for the Roman Church, the philosophy of Aristotle became as important and as authoritative as the Bible. Indeed, from their view, the Bible and Aristotelian philosophy were married, so that for many people, the two simply became one. You know, for those of you who know church history, you'll no doubt immediately recognize the name Thomas Aquinas. Aquinas lived in the 13th century, so some 400 years before Galileo. He's a very influential philosopher whose teachings dominated the church and who was enamored with Aristotle. And so in many ways, the nature of Roman Catholic theology became both Thomist and Aristotelian. You know, many thought that in some form, the gospel had been preached to the Greeks before the time of Christ through philosophers such as Aristotle. And then came a time just before Galileo when the science of Aristotle was slowly going out of style. Nicholas Copernicus had developed a very different cosmology with the sun at the center and the earth and the neighboring planets circling the sun. A new era in scientific discovery was dawning, but the church was still married to the old view. It was Keith Bauer who said, for the church, if Aristotle was wrong, Christianity was wrong. Now we come back to the Protestant Reformation. Because of Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, many others, including the Anabaptists, I, I could go on. The Roman church was feeling that it was losing its authority. Everywhere, Protestant preachers and theologians were, were trumpeting something they called sola scriptura, scriptures alone. They had had it with church doctrine. They believed that the Bible alone had the authority over the life of the people of God. But they also trumpeted something else. They called it sensus plenar. In Latin, it simply means the plain sense. That is, in order to understand the Bible, all you had to do was pay attention to the plain sense of the Bible. The Roman church had been teaching that there was a hidden and a secret and a spiritual side of Scripture, and only the church authorities could understand it. And the Protestant reformers said that was all just rubbish. And so the Roman Catholic Church was on its heels. There was a, a rebellion in the church and now a rebellion in the new science. Turns out that the church was wrong about the Bible, and now they were wrong about science as well. And the Roman church reacted, says Mark Beber, by, by publishing a list of literature forbidden for Catholics to read. They were clamping down hard. And then along came Galileo, but there's more. Many of the university professors who opposed Galileo were opposed for two reasons. First, they were jealous of him, his fame and popularity, and second, they realized that his theories would effectively end their careers. It was they, a group of Italian scientists called the Liga, who led the charge, convincing the church to utterly condemn this new science. Get your authority back. Put an end to all this rebellion. And so a holy tribunal condemned Galileo. It said, among other things, the proposition that the sun is the center of the world is absurd and false philosophically and formally heretical because it expressly is contrary to the Holy Scripture. And with this has come the idea that there's a great divide between science and the Bible. But as we've seen, nothing could be further from the truth. In truth, all the early scientists of the modern era were themselves Christians. Galileo himself never renounced his faith. Indeed, he wrote, I think in the first place that it is very pious to say and prudent to affirm that the Holy Bible can never speak untruth whenever its true meaning is understood. And that was Galileo's point. Science didn't contradict the scripture. Rather, the scripture has been improperly understood. Nicholas Copernicus held the same view. He disagreed with Aristotle, but not with the Bible. Isaac Newton held the same view. So did Johannes Kepler. So did Michael Faraday. All the early scientists of the modern era came out of the Christian worldview. And that brings me back to Psalm 19. The heavens really do declare the glory of God. And the law of God really does enlighten the eyes. And we can talk about both in one psalm and never see a contradiction. But ever since Galileo, the idea of antagonism between faith and science is now deeply rooted in many people's minds. And to be truthful, we've now moved beyond the movement of the planets 
to the age of the earth and the modern day theory of evolution, and that's where the battle is today. And for a great many people, the Bible is again on the opposite side of science. I'm going to deal with evolution tomorrow, so please listen to me then. But, and, and this may be shocking to many, but the real history of people who have believed the Bible is not that we reject science. We welcome it. We believe that God has indeed given us two books. And even though these books carry a different message, the two books are in harmony with each other. For in truth, the same God has written both books. And there's another lesson that we can learn from Galileo. The lesson is not just that sometimes Bible teachers get it wrong and and have their own biases, but the lesson is also that, that sometimes scientists get it wrong and have their own biases and actually resist the progress of science. And that's exactly what the history of Galileo taught us. Scientists must admit that they are not the objective gods of truth, but that they are as fallible as everyone else. And that's why we need the second book, the book that's called the Bible. We need something that will ground us back in the truth. We need something that will enlighten the eyes and give joy to the heart. And that's the great truth. The Bible and the created order are not in disagreement with each other, but they are in harmony. They are the two words that God has given us so that his speech can be clearly heard. John, I got to admit, your message today brings up all kinds of questions in my mind, uh, uh, one of which, of course, you're going to deal with tomorrow in the whole idea of evolution. But let me ask you a question. It seems like the church, or at least the right-wing evangelicals, seem to be in constant conflict with with some of the scientific things that are happening today, including the whole uh, uh, idea of global warming. Like, why are we in such conflict with these types of things? Yeah, that's very insightful, and it, it really is a kind of a conundrum. Now, I'm not making a statement about global warming or one way or the other because I am not a scientist. Um, but it, I do look to scientists and to, to give some kind of a direction in this. Uh, I don't know why we've made this a matter of faith. I don't think it's a matter of faith at all. It's let's follow the evidence wherever it actually leads us. Let's be as interested as everyone else in this matter. So, you know, if carbon-based emissions are contributing to global warming, then I guess they are. And if they're not, then I guess they're not. But it seems to me a scientific question And I'm with you, Ben. I actually don't understand why the church uh, would want to get into that. Um, It doesn't make any sense to me. And certainly, the Bible gives us no direction in that area at all. So I guess it's important to let the Bible speak for itself. Well, we're back to the Bible Canada, and we teach the Bible. You may or may not have noticed, we're mentioning Back to the Bible Canada's Israel experience in May 2018 less and less frequently. Well, here's the reason. We're already 70% full. That's right. So if you'd like to join Back to the Bible Canada's Bible teacher, Dr. John Newfeld, Laugh Again's own Phil Calloway, and special musical guest and gospel award-winning artist, Andrew Marcus, for this spectacular journey, do so now and avoid disappointment. In Israel, we'll be visiting so many extraordinary sites, such as King David's city, the Western Wall, the Garden Tomb, the Jordan River, and we'll even sail the Sea of Galilee and enjoy Bible teaching and worship. The list of locations goes on and on. And afterward, you'll never read the Bible with the same eyes again. So join us and call today to avoid disappointment at 1-800-663-2425 or visit backtothebible.ca.